Um, so the subject of the talk I'm going to give tonight is um, it's kind of a two-part thing. It's called Dirty New Media, Art, Activism, and Computer Countercultures. And so what, kind of like broadly what I'm going to talk about is um, this kind of like wave in new media art that moves towards instead of um, treating technologies as a kind of ideal, um, kind of treats them as complicated, qualified, um, kind of dirty, messy kind of things. And in taking that approach, um, how a lot of artists and hackers and activists are able to kind of blend the, the kind of divisions between those three roles and really kind of embrace all three of those roles at once. And that this is something that's been happening since the 70s, or, or you know, more properly since the 60s, in uh, video art and conceptual art and, and in media art. <clears throat> so this piece that's running right now is a performance by um, Morgan Higby Flowers and Brendan Pate. It happened in 2007 in Chicago at a space called Enemy. Um, and Brendan and Morgan work with um, VCRs, like running into audio mixers and running into boom boxes and then back into other VCRs. They build these really kind of complicated um, systems out of um, basically signal flow and kind of perverting the signal in different ways um, to produce these like really fucked up effects. Um, <clears throat> So they're already kind of like working with, this isn't, you know, software art necessarily, but they're, they're working with, um, with systems or something. They're working with electronic systems that are designed kind of from the ground up to be um, broken or in some other way kind of complicated or damaged. Um, there's a, a writer and artist named Matthew Fuller that, um, that, whose work is like kind of underpinning a lot of what's happening in this talk. Um, and he, he writes a lot about software art. He used to work with a group called... Um, IOD that did a sort of series of like software zines that were released on floppy disk um, that did stuff like renamed all the files on your computer into poetry or something like that. Really kind of aggro, kind of punk um, uh, kind of effects they had. They were, they were kind of like those disk releases, like early demo scene disk releases or something, but they were viruses or whatever, kind of art viruses. Um, and so I want to just like go over a few things that Matthew Fuller brings up in a paper that he wrote that was published earlier this year in a book called uh, Software Studies Lexicon. Um, the paper's called The Stuff of Software, and it kind of functions as the introduction to the, um, to the collection that, that he edited, the Software Studies Lexicon. So he says two things in this introduction that are, that are um, really kind of focusing for this talk. Um, the first thing is that software, and, and in this case I'd like to broaden our understanding of software in a kind of poetic way to kind of contain anything kind of systems-based that we're working on, anything where the system is the message or something. Um, so he says, software comprises simply and grimly of a social relation made systematic and unalterable. Um, so wh what he's talking about here is uh, where we take something that's like more properly kind of grounded as a social relationship. Um, this can be like the example that he gives is um, something like the Israeli-Palestine conflict or something like that. This is like a social conflict. Um, and there are ways that when we're making software, we make assumptions based on our positions in these social relations and kind of encode our positions into the system as fact or something. So um, the example that he refers to is um, like if you're signing up for a Yahoo email account or something and you have a drop down list of what country you're from and you identify yourself as being a member of the nation of Palestine, but it's not an option of the drop down list. So at that point, um, it's exposed to you that this social relation has been kind of like codified into a system that you can't alter, uh, into a system where you're disempowered. Um, and then another example that, that, that I like is um, like the kind of gender binary male female thing. This is on like every website um, when you Want to, when, when you are making a profile or something that's required field gender and it's male, female, it's like either, you know, it's, it's like an enumerated list or something. This is like an assumption that um, comes up that's a social assumption if you subscribe like I do to the gender being a kind of social construct or something. Um, it's a social assumption that comes out in a technical way when the developer is looking at like what's all the data I need to store? Well, okay, one thing is gender and what data type is gender? Well, okay, it's binary or something or it's an enumerated list or something like that. Um, whereas if you're like, you know, if you're in that band Throbbing Gristle or something like that, maybe you consider it like a spectrum or something. Um, so another thing that um, Fuller says, this is like, so th that's, that's most software for Matthew Fuller, most kind of systems-based work for Matthew Fuller. Um, but then and there's another kind of like body of work that he's interested in that he's trying to push. Uh, he says, by contrast, when technology is used in a way that's, um, he uses the word interrogable, um, which really just means hackable uh, or open to question. Um, when technology is used in a way that's interrogable or hackable, 
It allows and encourages those subjects networked or enmeshed within it to gain traction on its multiple scales of operation. Okay, this is kind of art speak or something, but all, or you know, like philosophy speak or something, but all he's really saying is um, when the software is implemented as an incomplete project, in other words, when um, I'm gonna, when I'm creating that um, like form for you to fill out to sign up for MySpace, and I say, you know, like, well, let's let the user choose the data type, um, or I say, let's let the user add a field or something. When I leave it kind of open to question what the system actually is and kind of present it in that way, um, then that lets, that lets people like kind of take a position, that lets people become empowered and you know, kind of sit within the system in a, in a way where they have agency or something. Um, so this, were, oh, actually this is kind of funny too. This, this is like video documentation of this performance and like the DV tape got eaten. So there's this whole other layer of like awesome kind of like fucked up grid stuff happening on there or something that was, um, okay. So I, like as an example of a kind of system that was um, built broken or built open or built um, open to question or hackable from the start, I want to show another piece that's from the same, uh, same screening, which was this was a screening called real time or a, really a kind of a night of performance called real time that happened in uh, 2007. Um, and this one does have sound. It's pretty loud. He actually went on and played for like another 10 minutes, but um, basically what he was doing was um, he had a kind of like video feedback set up with a, an old television that he was like directly shocking with a uh, taser, I think. Um, so, and, and the kind of like lifespan of the piece was in, until the, yeah, until the television died or something like that. <clears throat> um, so in, in this way, he kind of like takes the, the television system, you know, which is a system that we're really encultured to. Um, and like kind of aggressively like turns it into a hackable system or something like that. It's like in a kind of invasive, kind of playfully kind of invasive way. Um, there's another artist that I want to show now. This is um, an excerpt from a, a film by, you may have seen it called Sans Soleil. It's from 1980. It's by Chris Marker. It's like a pretty famous um, uh, kind of pseudo documentary. Um, <clears throat> where he's, he's looking at um, here how people can take kind of um, political situations and kind of invasively um, hack them like that. Yao Yamaneko has found a solution. If the images of the present don't change, then change the images of the past. He showed me the clashes of the 60s treated by his synthesizer. Pictures that are less deceptive, he says, with the conviction of a fanatic than those you see on television. At least they proclaim themselves to be what they are, images, not the portable and compact form of an already inaccessible reality. Hayao calls his machine's world the zone, a homage to Tarkovsky.
What Narita brought back to me like a shattered hologram was an intact fragment of the generation of the 60s. If to love without illusions is still to love, I can say that I loved it. It was a generation that often exasperated me. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, does, does, that, does that make sense? It's like kind of lo looking at reality as something we can filter and process and integrate into another system and kind of open it up in a new way, um, opening up our relationship to mediated images or something in a way by kind of like, you know, with, with this, this tool, the, the zone, the synthesizer, or actually I think he, the zone is like the material that comes out of the synthesizer. I don't know what the synthesizer is called, but, um, but the synthesizer is kind of an artist-made tool, video synthesizer for reprocessing reality or for putting some filters on reality or something. Um, and yeah, it's called Sans Soleil, which is French. Here, let me put it up here. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll make that. Yeah, it's French. <laughs> um, and it's by. Uh, Um, <laughs> so these, these video synthesizers are really kind of interesting too because, um, because they're, they, they often kind of function as artworks in themselves, you know, they're like highly stylized, uh, they're talked about in a really kind of interesting stylized way by the, the artist developers, the artist hardware hackers or artist programmers or something that build them. Um, and w one of the kind of early video synthesizers is... Um, or one of the kind, of, the kind of most popular early video synthesizers is by this guy from Chicago, Dan Sandin, who um, worked then and still does at the um, Electronic Visualization Lab at UIC. Um, he built a machine called the Sandin Image Processor that was a, a similar, it was like an analog computer for doing um, video signal processing. It was really cool. Um, he worked with um, Phil Morton a lot, uh, who's like a video artist and activist from the 70s, um, or, you know, he had a long career. Um, but so I'm, I want to show a piece from. Uh, an excerpt from a video by Phil Morton called General Motors, um, which is, it, you can find it on Google Video. Um, I, we've uploaded it to Google Video, and it's, it's super crazy. Like, you, you should really check it out. This excerpt shows um, a kind of walkthrough of, uh, there's a little bit of the Sandy image processor in it, but it's mostly about this kind of like programming interface. Um, and I, I think the one they're using in here is Grass which is the um, graphics subsystem or something, ostensibly. We, you know, we know what they really mean, but it's, um, it's like this kind of programming interface for doing graphics that actually the uh, Death Star sequence in A New Hope was developed by Larry Cuba using this interface, right? You know? So, yeah, many Bothans died in the production of this film. Um, <laughs> to give you a little quick tour of this laboratory in the chemistry department, we'll take you over the computer here. This single bay houses the graphics computer. And uh, this down here, of course, is the PDP-1145 computer. Behind this panel is 28,000 words of memory. This here is the disk drive, the mass storage medium we use to hold pictures and uh, macros and other information used to run the graphics system. Up here is the A to D converters, which allow us to use dials and knobs and sliders and other things to control images. From the computer's memory go wires that go over to the vector general. And as you can see, the vector general head is capable of putting up images in real time, rotating them around. What we do there is point TV cameras at them, little TV cameras like this, which you can move around and center and uh, get different parts of the screen. And then, because color is much more fun than black and white, we run cables over this way to a very colorful person, Dan Sandin, inventor of the image processor. Now the basic way we do things here is that we take images from the vector general, route them via cables to the image processor, colorize them, and tape record them. Yeah. The single thing that's hardest to communicate in a paper like this is the interactivity of the system. For instance, anything that can be controlled in this system can be controlled through the use of slide potentiometers or dials, like these. What we're going to do now is show you how we make up simple objects like this. But first, you can see the room lights reflecting in the screen, so we normally work with the room lights off. Now we turn up the colors. 
your room lights are actually still off, what we've done here is put up some infrared lights and Cross Eye over there has an infrared sensitive camera. So we can show you the working environment of the room while we're actually doing things and still get high quality video without the room lights. The regular TV cameras are not sensitive to infrared light. First thing we have to do to show you how we make this little flying starch molecule is restart the system. We're also superimposing the VTO5 type on the screen. We get the starch molecule up and we get the propeller from the disc. The first thing anyone does with propellers is rotate them. But that appears to be the wrong axis. So there's something kind of interesting happening there when they've got the code superimposed over the output of the code or something. And he's like kind of walking through the code in this very, um, very open kind of way or something. I mean, it's kind of a how-to video or something. But it's also, um, it's also this thing that's very popular right now that's called live coding. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of, I'm going to mute it because the music is, anyway, I'm going to mute it. Um, but, <laughs> whoops, not that one. That one has great music. Okay, so this is a tool called Fluxus. Um, and this, this is taken from a kind of workshop um, about how to use Fluxus. Fluxus is like, yeah, so it's this live coding tool. There's a bunch of them now. It's like Super Collider is a really popular one. Um, and they're, um, they're performance tools, but um, this group of people, um, or th there are some like kind of like live coding. There's TopLap as a group. It's kind of an artist collective uh, that are all into live coding. And they have these kind of like, they're very kind of Dogma 95 or something like that. They have these rules about how it has to go down. Um, so one thing that has to happen is that, um, that you have to have your process, you have to be writing all the code while you're performing, and you have to have your text editor or whatever displayed. So Fluxus is a you know, VJ tool, basically. Um, and it's designed in the same way as, as Grass, if that was Grass. I think it was Grass. Um, so the code is getting edited, you know, like on top of the thing. The code is actually, you know, it's kind of interesting in a, uh, in a stage way. I mean, the code is actually in front of the, <laughs> of the you know, VJ stuff that's happening in the background. So the, the code is really kind of in the foreground. Um, that's a kind of like openness. Uh, you know, there's, there's a kind of ethics of open source around a lot of uh, contemporary new media art. Uh, not, not all of it, but a lot of it. Um, so I think that that's maybe where some of that, that kind of like ethical impetus to, to do this is coming from. Some of it is also this kind of performance of mastery of like being super awesome at writing scheme code really fast to like get a crazy spider Taurus doing some super tripped out shit. Um, and, um, oh, and then Fluxus also takes audio input so you can sync it to like um, cheesy dance music if you want to. Uh. Yeah. I don't know, this is not that bad. It's a little distracting. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, one thing that, that is different about the approach of something like um, Grass or The Zone or the uh, Sandine IP or Fluxus is um, there, there, there is like a part of the, um, a part of the app that's like, you know, kind of um, compromised in an artistic way or something, like kind of put it into an artistic content. But they're mostly just tools. And, and they're often kind of talked about and critiqued uh, strictly in terms of being tools. But in this kind of, um, the way that I want to talk about um, dirty new media art, the way that I want to talk about that category of art, um, I, is that there is not a, there's not a distinction made between tools and, and you know, the output of the tools or something. Um, in other words, uh, people often talk about software as, um, about the ideology, the prevailing ideology of software as being kind of utilitarianism. Um, you know, where we think of software as a black box or something, where you like, think of software as a, a processor or something like that. In, in other words, software is something that you do input to and you get output from. It's, it's completely utilitarian. Um, and and for, for this category of dirty new media, I'd like, to, I'd like to think of a kind of more expanded, you know, there is a way in which software functions ideologically in, in a kind of utilitarian mode. Um, but there's also like all kinds of weird shit happening at the edges. There's like a lot of literary stuff happening in uh, like Microsoft Word or something. You know, there are, there are like real decisions being made about the language that's used there. Um, there's like, you know, user interface design is, um, you know, kind of being talked about often as a, as a fairly precise science, but there's some voodoo in there too. And there's some cultural assumptions that bubble up in user interface design. Um, 
so there, so there are some artists working now that are really focused on that, like really focused on taking um, kind of software applications that are not meant to be um, art, you know, not meant to be used to make art or something, and making art from them or making them into art in the same way, in, the, in this kind of like Dada ready-made sense, you know, the same way that like Marcel Duchamp takes uh, urinal and puts it in a gallery and calls it the fountain or something like that. Um, in, a, in a similar kind of way, this is a piece by uh, Jody, which is a duo uh, Dutch artists. Um, uh, this is a piece called um, My Desktop. <laughs> Yeah, they're great. <laughs> that was, uh, I'll just put it up here so you guys can. That was Jody. Whoa. <laughs> and um, their website is jody.org. And that piece is called My Desktop. Um, they, have a, they have a kind of, in the kind of net art, you know, new media art world, they have a kind of canonical piece that's um, called Wrong Browser. You know, this comes from the late 90s where the, there was this like construct of like you're using the wrong browser or something that was like really part of the web or, or anyway, um, that's a good piece. Um, <clears throat> so here's, here's another piece that's along uh, very similar lines by an artist named John Satram who lives in Chicago. Um, this is called ROM Zero. Information can also be added to automatically appear whenever you create a purchase order or enter a purchase for the vendor.
clicking an area on the navigation aid takes you to that window. to enter information. So there's another thing that comes up in those last two pieces, especially in John's work, um, is this kind of like, it's like super playful, right? Uh, and, it, and it has like a real strong kind of relationship to video games and video game culture. Like that was, you know, he used Second Life to construct that piece, he, or you know, for parts of it. He also, um, the part where the deer is like jumping up on that platform, um, John does a lot of work with this um, game development tool in OS X called like Power Game Builder or something like that, and making these kind of crazy platform games out of elements from user interfaces and like, ridiculous animated gifts he finds online and stuff. So um, the, the kind of playful thing is also like um, a really powerful tool uh, as I've seen it employed in, in this, again what I'm talking about is dirty new media. Um, it's like a, it's functions a really powerful tool for kind of like cutting across hierarchies or kind of you know cutting across all these different, like when Matthew Fuller talks about there's all these different layers at which software is operating, there's like ideological layers, economic layer and stuff like that and, and for, you know for him it's really important to like um, when critiquing software or when critiquing new media to come at it you know as like a very multi-layered thing or something. So um, this playfulness can just really slice through all those different layers and like you know cut them all open at once. It's kind of like in uh, you know like like the the carnival or something like that you know that's like kind of all about flattening hierarchies just for a night or something uh, in, you know in a playful way. Um, and so that relationship to video games and and game culture and play and stuff is is kind of where I'm going to try to connect this stuff with the demo scene, which I, I don't think I'm gonna show, or I'm not gonna show too much of it, because I think it's probably something that, that a lot of people here are familiar with. Um, and and if, you know, if you're not familiar with and you want more information, you should um, look up, like, you know, Jason Scott is, is here. He knows, like, you know, he's done a lot of, like, historical work on that. And um, also Jim Leonard has done a lot of, like, collection, collecting old demo scene stuff. But basically the, um, the kind of beginnings of the demo scene were in, um, were in pirating video games. So like, um, you know, if I'm, I've cracked like a new floppy of um, Super Off-Road and I want everybody to know that it was my crew that cracked it because we're the latest shit on the block. Um, so I'm gonna put some sweet banner like up in front of it, you know? And then like, you know, after a while it was like, well, I need to make a lot of shout outs and I'm kind of running out of space. So maybe if there's a way I could animate all my shout outs because I have like 700 shout outs. Um, so what kind of grew out of that is this, um, this kind of like form of having these awesome animations that play in front of um, the games that you crack when you redistribute them. And then there's also these interesting technical restrictions because, um, you know, some of the games maybe they do like a checksum or something, or maybe they, um, maybe there's not very much room left on the disc anyway, so maybe you're limited to like 4K for your code or something. So then, then you get to be super elite because now you can make this crazy graphical intro and you only used 4K of code or something. Anyway, that's the kind of like, um, you know, kind of history of the origins of the demo scene. I'm just going to show one um, cracked intro. This is from 1990. And this is by a group called Paradox, and we'll just kind of look at it for a second. <laughs> Which I, I picked this one because it was dirty. Um, but anyway, I think you get the answer. 
there's, some, there's more, more of this kind of, you know, really playful stuff going on here. Um, and, um, and it's still, you know, part of the demo scene now. There's like a lot of, a lot of play happening there, um, which, which I think is about, um, okay, anyway. <laughs> um, which I think is about the demo scene. Um, it's, you know, it's not, it's not like directly, or it, you know, it still has some ties to software piracy, and there's still like, an, there's still an art scene and an ASCII scene, especially for doing info files for um, pirated software. Um, but, but it, you know, it has a pretty, um, pretty robust relationship to the rest of the kind of software world, to the rest of the new media world at this point. Um, you know, there's like all this stuff where graphics card companies get, you know really lead demo coders to do their graphics for the new NVIDIA card or something like that. Um, so I think the playfulness is there um, now still and, and was there in the beginning to kind of, you know, help connect this kind of like grassroots um, digital art work that was happening in front of the stuff, this kind of like illegal, you know, and by illegal, you know, that, that kind of includes like marginalized, you know, this kind of marginalized work that was happening to kind of cut through that into the body of the rest of the kind of software or art stuff or digital art that was happening or something. Um, I, I don't know if I should show this or not, but yeah, okay, I'll just show it. Um, I, last, uh, at the last block party, you guys know block party, which is, it's like a demo party competition thing in, in Cleveland. It's, this was the second year. It's attached to Nauticon, which you guys probably know Nauticon at least. Um, and J Jason Scott and Radman from um, Acid like organized it. Um, so, so I work with this group called Critical Artware, and um, uh, we're we're like kind of an artist collective concern, art historical concern. And um, we went like two years ago. And we made a demo, and it was like we got last place, which was pretty sweet. And um, and then we went again this year, and we made another demo that I'm going to show you. Um, and we were hope we were hoping for last place, um, but we uh, we actually just got disqualified, which is it's not quite not <laughs> quite what I was hoping for, but. Um, There's more. Uh, I, I think uh, you know they have a really nice machine for the competition to show. It has, it's like a SLI NVIDIA, you know, dream machine. It doesn't run very well on my laptop, but uh, it probably would have run really well on that one. There's a, yeah, there's just a bunch of fucked up stuff with windows bouncing all over the place. So. Um, and that video that was um, that was playing in the beginning was Jason Scott dancing in front of our demo from the year before or something. So. <clears throat> Wow, I just—I think I crashed Gnome with that demo. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you know, it runs in Windows too. It runs in it runs in Vista. It looks great in Vista. Uh, wow, I don't really know what to do about that. Dan. Dan. Yeah, right. <laughs> cool. Um, well, I'll tell you what. There's 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 one more piece that I want to show. Um, but I guess. I have to reboot. So maybe what I'd like to do since we, sorry? Yeah, you know what? I disabled that because I always hit it on accident. Um, but actually, I can't even get to the, the virtual consoles. Control. Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thanks, dude. I appreciate that. No problem. We disqualified you for a reason. <laughs> Cool. Um, so I guess what I'd like to do is like try to reboot this, and um, you know we still have like maybe 15 minutes or something. So maybe I could just take questions and then reboot it, and then I just want to show you this one other What's piece. The and then... <laughs> what? Oh yeah, cool. <laughs> so um, yeah, do you guys have any any questions or thoughts or anything like that? Um, yeah. Why'd you get disqualified? Uh, you can ask Jason about. It. I mean, I think it was. Um, 
you know, I mean, well, they said it didn't work, okay, at first, but, and, you know, and I was like, well, yeah, and then they were like, um, they said it was also it was too hostile, um, and, you know, that's fair, I don't, I don't know what to, oh, cool, yeah, yeah, let's talk about it, dude, what happened? Awesome, let's have it now. It was awesome to do it during the event, too. Okay. Cool. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Scott. I run a party called Block Party at Not A Con, which is an excellent con held out in Cleveland, Ohio. We're having another one next year um, in April of 2009. Anyway, so one of the things that Block Party is, is it's based off of a kind of a European demo party where there are various demos that are shown. Uh, there's also music pieces, graphics pieces, in other words, kind of an art show. And um, what we encountered, well, the first time we saw their work from the first one, we simply assumed it was some sort of prank. That's fair. And that's one of those things that can really be interpreted. You see, the, <laughs> like if, you have, if, you're having, if you're having a music contest and someone comes over and shits in the tuba, And, and defecating. Yeah, that's that Duchamp piece I was talking about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and he goes, oh, no, 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 that's sunset in B flat. Um, <laughs> the judges have to make the decision whether or not okay. it will change the tenor. So, anyway, so when the second one came and it opened up multiple windows on the desktop and then started to act really weird and sent out a noise that would kill a chicken. We had to make the decision of whether or not we wanted to play that over a multi-thousand watt system at people. <laughs> but actually, to bring it back to his beautiful talk here, that's part of the problem when you kind of stretch the boundaries of what is art and what is music. And sometimes you will just not be appreciated. Uh, Dali was considered a pretty weird out, ignored person until he had a fight over a placement of some art in his gallery and he threw a bathtub through a window. <clears throat> the resulting press from that got a lot more interest in his surrealist work before then and was part of his road to success. So what I'm telling them is that they should throw a bathtub through the window. <laughs> anyway. Cool. Thanks for the input. <laughs> oh, no problem. <laughs> That's true. That thing about multiple windows, we were like, oh, we're pushing something. You know, we're, we're doing something with this. I know. Yeah. Um, okay. Thanks, Jason. Okay, so, um, so I'm just going to show show this one other piece, and then um, it's quarter till. Maybe we'll have time for like just a couple questions or something, or, or maybe not. I don't know. Um.
So I, I love presets as a, oh, sorry. Congratulations. You have been selected to receive two free iPod Nanos. Uh, it, I love presets as a, a trio. It's um, uh, John Satram, we showed that Rom, Rom Zero video, and um, Jason Soliday and um, Rob Ray. And so Rob Ray and Jason Soliday are sound artists, and they're working with like a lot of circuit bent equipment. Um, and then John does the video, and, and then he does some sound stuff sometimes. Um, so he's, he uses um, some circuit bent video equipment that's like um, that that he's built. And then also like one of the things we saw in that video was um, a kind of prepared Excel spreadsheet. Actually, I think it was like an open office spreadsheet, but you know, kind of prepared so he could just scroll through it and it would do those weird interference patterns with that stuff. And then he was using a little bit of the you know expose stuff like like Jody used in the. Um, the the video. Cool. <clears throat> okay, so we're just a little bit of time. Maybe we can do like one or one or two questions. If um, yeah, good. Oh, do you, I th they wanted me to remind you to use the microphones. Is there like a mic around? Oh, in the back. You're right, right there in the middle. I just a quick comment. Oh yeah. Um, the just a script, um, can I buy that from the Apple I, uh, uh, the Apple phone? Uh, oh, are are you asking me if the Python? Break? Oh, if if my demo runs on the iPhone? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I don't, I don't have an iPhone, but um, yeah, I don't see why not. I don't see what, we, yeah. Could, did, sorry, but he not. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of funny to hear software to be described as something that's so rigid when, in a lot of ways, it's one of the more malleable forms of media we ever had. I, I completely hmm. recognize the kinds of constraints and ideologies that you're talking about, and I'm wondering if it's helpful for you, or have you thought about software being um, compared more to architecture as a system of, of building things that recognizes the, the ideologies and economies and layers that are implicit in the th kinds of things that we're creating? Cool, yeah, I like that way of talking about it. Um, I, I, and I, I, like, um, I like what you said about thinking of, thinking of software as being malleable versus, versus think, you know, um, because, because that, is, that is another way that software is talked about very often, yeah, it's about being super malleable. And, um, and, and also the, the kind of output of the, you know, when, when we talk about um, malleability and software, we're kind of talking about two stages, right? We're talking about the stage where you're coding it or architecting it or something. We're talking about the stage where you're using it. Um, and uh, at both of those stages, there is like a kind of, a kind of tension between malleability and, and rigidness, yeah. So in, and what you're saying about architecture is that um, you, you think that where architecture is at now is that it's dealing with this, all these layers at a, in a kind of qualified way or something? Is that what? Well, to the extent that uh, software is being used to create environments nowadays yeah, that okay. mediate human-to-human -human interactions. I mean, that's yeah. a domain that's been well understood and regarded. And so the notion that software architecture is beginning to resemble traditional architecture as a leading art is sort of the way I've been trying to think about it lately. Yeah, cool. And there, you know, there are a lot of um, kind of art kind of architecture projects that are more on the art side that we could really look at um, in, in terms of like opening up our thinking to kind of making really radical software architecture right now. There's like those, um, the, some of the, well, there's like, you know, the Bucky Fuller stuff that's like kind of radical and interesting. But then there's also... Um, Over at the Whitney right now for anyone oh, really? who's in town. Cool. Yeah, a whole show on Buckle. Cool. <laughs> okay, thanks. <clears throat> uh, I don't know, do we, how, how are we doing on time? What's that? Okay, like, yeah, like one more? Or, yeah. Okay. What's a good live coding framework for people who don't know Lisp? Who don't know Lisp? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've used Super Collider a bit. It's pretty weird. It's like, um, uh, it's kind of like small talk or something. It's got the, or that, that's kind of his legacy. I don't know if it's like really, a, a, that's, I don't know how good a reference that is practically or something. Um, and then there's Chuck, which is pretty cool. Um, Chuck uses like a, um, it's, uh, it has all these operators and stuff. It's like it's kind of more of like a. It's a little more procedural or something um, than you know Lisp, which is really functional, and declarative. It's like a little more procedural, imperative. Um, so which which actually you know works pretty well in a live coding context. Um, and then a lot of people work with Python actually in live coding and JavaScript too. You can do like yeah the cool because you can run you know like you can use like jQuery or some other kind of JavaScript. JavaScript framework um, to just make these like interesting animations in the browser using like Firebug or something, you know, where you have an interactive JavaScript interpreter. Um, you can make, yeah, you can do performances in there, playing QuickTime files and stuff. So too. to do stuff with Python, people just like use Pygame and Pyglot and just yeah, act yeah, because you can run all that stuff from the interpreter. Right. Yeah. Okay. Totally. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay. Maybe, maybe I think we have another minute or something. Yeah. Okay, it was 
except for Sans Soleil. Sans Soleil. Oh, okay. Where are the other activist connections or something? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> well, I think one way is I think the act of like the kind of flattening hierarchies, that kind of like impulse is, is an activist impulse or something. Um, in terms of like on the streets um, kind of work or something, there, the, the project that I was doing at Daisy Chain, um, which is that free computer lab or something that I was running, was kind of approaching um, computer education as a place to experiment with kind of radical arts education. Um, and so that was, that was kind of an activist intent. Also this fellow, um, Matthew Fuller, that I referenced like several times throughout the talk, is like this super hardcore um, Marxist. And he's, and like a lot of his stuff is about, um, you know, he talks a lot about the streets. Um, he talks a lot about thinking about how, you know, he has this kind of construct of um, uh, street smarts or something. Street smarts in a kind of, um, uh, like in, uh, kind of like tactical stuff or something like you know like this tactical strategic dichotomy or something street smarts is like being a kind of bottom up grassroots um, radical practice or something so he talks about how can we take our street smarts you know how can we take that and live that way on the web or something or you know which the you know web is kind of the focus in in the mid 90s of like this dialogue about software uh, in, in this kind of like um, critical dialogue about software. Now we can talk about you know a lot, a lot of applications in that way. How can we take our, our street street smarts and and like apply them to our relationships with software or something? Um, yeah. Cool. Okay. I think that's it. Thanks a lot, guys.